Motor development may not initially seem like the most interesting topic, especially compared to language and cognitive development. In fact, motor development has been considered the, quote, Cinderella of developmental science, end quote, central to children's experiences, but rarely in the spotlight. Historically, a maturational approach to motor skills was predominant in the early 20th century, which mainly argued that motor development unfolds via predetermined biological changes with little to no influence from environmental or cognitive domains. Isolation of motor skills resulted in very little research focusing on the role of motor skills on other domains of development. However, recent research is embracing the possibility of cross-domain interactions resulting in cascading developmental changes. Furthermore, motor development is about more than just milestones. Because motor development can be easily observed by caregivers, it reveals the inner workings of an infant's mind and introduces the child to new experiences that enrich cognitive and language growth. This section will introduce you to the early motor development of infants and toddlers with special attention to the role the physical environment and caregivers have in supporting and encouraging optimal motor development. Reflexes Before infants produce self-initiated movements, they exhibit inborn reflexes. Infants are born with a number of reflexes which are involuntary movements in response to stimulation, controlled by the brainstem. These include the sucking reflex. Infants suck on objects that touch their lips automatically. The rooting reflex, which involves turning toward any object that touches the cheek. The palmer grasp. Infants will tightly grasp any object placed in their palm. And the dancing reflex, evident when infants are held in a standing position and move their feet up and down alternately as if dancing. These movements occur automatically and are signals that the infant is functioning well neurologically. Over the first few months of life, these reflexes are replaced with voluntary movements. For example, the grasping reflex develops by 28 weeks gestation and disappears by six months of age. The asymmetrical tonic neck reflex is performed by manual rotation of the infant's head to one side. The infant will extend its arm to the side of the rotated face and flex the contralateral arm. The asymmetrical tonic neck reflex develops by 35 weeks gestation and disappears by three months of age. These inborn reflexes fade within predictable time frames and can be a sign of concern if they remain longer. Children with reflexes that persist for longer than expected show lower motor abilities learning difficulties in school, and are linked to attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, ADHD symptoms. Developing a sense of peripersonal space. Throughout the first few months, infants move their limbs frequently, driven initially by reflexes and later by self-initiation. And as they do, they come into contact with their body and various objects and people around them. While these early movements may not seem important, they are actually a way for infants to begin to learn about themselves and the world around them. Developing a sense of our body is an essential prerequisite for our interactions with the world. Sensing our body entails knowing where our limbs are in space and time, being aware of how fast or how far our limbs can move, or even knowing how much space our body occupies in our environment. Peripersonal space is defined as the space surrounding the body where we can reach or be reached by external entities, including objects or other individuals. Knowing the limits and extent of our peripersonal space is fundamental for navigating our social and physical world, and for situating and orienting ourselves in everyday activities. With every touch of their body and surrounding areas, infants are receiving feedback that informs them about their posture any changes in limb position, and about contact with themselves or other surfaces, thereby allowing them to discover knowledge of not only their limbs and their range of motion, but also an understanding of their peripersonal space. These self-generated movements, as infants move their limbs freely, provide a foundation for exploratory behavior and build a basic understanding of body representation and of the world. 
touches to the body in particular provide information about the limb posture in space, the part of the limb making contact with the body, and the body area being touched. Research that has studied young infants exploring peripersonal space through touch have found that infants produce nearly 200 contacts on their body and the surrounding surface area in a 10 minute time period, and touch as many as 18 different areas, mainly their upper body and the floor. Infants also spend about 50% of that time moving their arms in the air, going from one place of contact to another. The figure on the screen maps the frequency of touches to various areas of the body and surrounding surface area from one infant. The blue dots are contacts performed by the infant's right hand, and the red dots are contacts performed by the infant's left hand. Such touching is fundamental for developing an early sense of the body and for discovering the boundaries of the peripersonal space in which future developing goal-directed actions will take place. In fact, other research has found that greater arm movement in early infancy is related to larger increases in language and cognitive abilities. Together, this research suggests that infants are active explorers of their peripersonal space, and that these early self-generated sensory motor experiences form the critical foundation from which future motor behaviors and knowledge of the world develop. To support the exploration of peripersonal space, Infants need time and space to move and explore with their limbs. Caregivers can ensure that infants have ample time lying comfortably on their backs on floors to support limb movement. Young infants also need space without the consistent overcrowding of play objects or frequently being placed in an activity gym device. Additionally, infant swings, car seats, and many other devices limit limb movement and therefore restrict exploration of peripersonal space. To freely move their limbs, infants need clothes that allow for full range reaching, compared to clothes or swaddles that reduce limb movement. Realizing how important it is for infants to explore their peripersonal space, caregivers should be cognizant of the significance of providing the time and space for infants to move their limbs as they learn about their bodies and the surrounding surface areas. The research on the importance of peripersonal space supports some of the methods Emmy Pickler and Magda Gerber touted. However, their influence on the field of early childhood education goes much further and continues to inform current practices in infant and toddler care and development, especially motor development. Pickler was born in 1902 and spent her early childhood in Vienna. She obtained her medical degree in 1927 and became a pediatrician. Later, she founded the Pickler Institute in Budapest in 1946, which she headed until 1979. Pickler believed that infants should be put on their backs until they themselves can move into different positions. By being on their backs, she argued, infants learn about their bodies and how to move their bodies as they reach, bend, and touch while playing with various movements. Importantly, an infant's movements are driven by their own internal motivation to move. Pickler advised caregivers to not place infants on their stomachs until they move themselves into that position. Her observations and years of work with children informed her belief in allowing children the freedom of self-initiated movement. Although Pickler's work provides various principles to learn from, here are four core principles. Deep respect for the child and their individuality, recognizing them as an individual with rights, rather than an object. Promotion of the child's autonomous activity based on their own initiatives. The importance of the bond between the adult caregiver and the child, based on a respectful and affective relationship in quality moments of care. Respect for the child's freedom of movement, for playing and exploring their parapersonal space and surroundings. Megda Gerber was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1910. Inspired by Pickler, Gerber earned a master's degree in early childhood education in Budapest, and in 1945, she began working with Pickler at the Pickler Institute. Over time, Pickler became Gerber's mentor and friend. In 1978, Gerber and Thomas Forrest co-founded the nonprofit organization Resources for Infant Educarers, RIE, in Los Angeles to further their work with families and childcare professionals. At RIE, 
Gerber taught caregivers to observe infants and toddlers as they played, while a facilitator modeled how and when to intervene. The basic principles of the Rye approach are basic trust in the child to be an initiator, an explorer, and a self-learner, an environment for the child that is physically safe, cognitively challenging, and emotionally nurturing, time for uninterrupted play, freedom to explore and interact with other infants, involvement of the child in all caregiving activities to allow the child to be an active participant rather than a passive recipient, sensitive observation of the child in order to understand their needs, consistency and clearly defined limits and expectations to develop discipline. Rye's mission is to improve the lives of infants and young children through respectful care. Gerber believed that infants and toddlers are whole, competent beings from birth and should be treated as such. Gerber wrote, We not only respect babies, we demonstrate our respect every time we interact with them. Respecting a child means treating even the youngest infant as a unique human being, not as an object. As you reflect on the ideas and principles from Pickler and Gerber, consider these questions. Do you agree or disagree with their ideas and principles? How do their ideas and principles challenge common advice and caregiving practices about supporting infant and toddler motor development? In your experience working with infants and toddlers, have you seen their ideas and principles implemented? What does respecting an infant and toddler look like? What are the benefits and challenges caregivers and group care programs could experience when implementing their ideas and principles? Motor development trends. The physical bodies of infants and toddlers show common growth trends and these trends relate to motor development. There are two important trends, cephalocaudal and proximal distal. The cephalocaudal trend acknowledges a top-down growth trend. For example, Infants may use their upper limbs before their lower limbs. The proximal distal trend, on the other hand, acknowledges growth from the center of the body outwards. For example, infants use their arms before they can use their fingers effectively. Resources on infant and toddler development sometimes mistakenly reference cephalocaudal and proximal distal trends as principles. The reason they are trends and not principles is that they only describe what typically happens a trend, as not all infants show motor development that exactly follows these trends. For example, research has shown that some infants will reach for and interact with objects using their feet before they are able to do so with their hands, which does not follow the cephalocaudal trend. The picture on the screen is of an infant using both feet to interact with a book while being read to by a caregiver. Gross and Fine Motor Development Motor skills are often broadly divided into gross motor and fine motor skills. Gross motor skills pertain to skills involving large muscle movements such as independent sitting, crawling, or walking. Fine motor skills involve use of smaller muscles such as grasping, object manipulation, or drawing. Motor Milestones Infants and toddlers are constantly learning about the world as they experience it and actively engage with it during the first three years of life. Milestones represent what most children, 75% or more, can do by specific ages. This chart represents the new and improved milestone charts provided by the CDC in 2022, with substantial evidence-based updates. These milestone charts are meant to prompt surveillance and conversation and, if needed, identification and early intervention. The CDC adopts a proactive stance. We should take action early when developmental concerns arise rather than the perspective of waiting to see if a child, quote, catches up, end quote. While children do develop at individual paces, being proactive during these crucial early years is essential. The chart on the screen lists milestones that if children are not achieving by specific ages, caregivers should encourage parents to communicate with their family's pediatrician. Most caregivers are not professionally trained to officially assess the developmental abilities of children. However, caregivers have the ability to track developmental progress and are often the first to notice developmental concerns. Here's a table of some of the motor milestones for infants and toddlers. By two months of age, most children can hold their head up when on their tummy. 
Move both arms and both legs. Open their hands briefly. By four months of age, most children can hold their head steady without support while being held, hold a toy when placed in their hand, use their arms to swing at toys, bring their hands to their mouth, push up on their elbows, forearms, when on their tummy. By six months of age, most children can roll from tummy to back, push up with straight arms when on their tummy, lean on their hands for support when sitting. By nine months of age, most children can get into a seating position independently, move things from one hand to the other, use fingers to rake food toward themselves, sit without support. By 12 months of age, most children can pull up to stand, walk holding on to furniture, drink from a cup without a lid as you hold it, pick things up between thumb and pointer finger like small bits of food. By 15 months of age, most children can take a few steps independently, use fingers to feed themselves some food. By 18 months of age, most children can walk without holding on to anyone or anything, scribble, drink from a cup without a lid and may spill sometimes, feed themselves with their fingers, try to use a spoon, climb on and off a couch or a chair without help. By 24 months of age, most children can kick a ball, run, walk, not climb, up a few stairs with or without help, eat with a spoon. By 30 months of age, most children can use their hands to twist things like turning doorknobs or unscrewing lids, take some clothes off independently like loose pants or an open jacket, jump off the ground with both feet. Turn book pages one at a time when you read with them. By 36 months of age, most children can string items together like large beads or macaroni, put on some clothes independently like loose pants or a jacket, use a fork. The motor milestones from the CDC are based on data from infants and toddlers in the US, which may not accurately represent the motor development of children from other countries. The chart on the screen is based on research conducted by the World Health Organization. It presents windows of achievement for six gross motor development milestones based on infants and toddlers from five countries, Ghana, India, Norway, Oman, and the USA. The six milestones in the chart are sitting without support, standing with assistance, hand and knees crawling, walking with assistance, standing alone, and walking alone. Based on this research, there are a few findings worth noting. In general, there is a common order in achieving these milestones. First, children are able to sit without support, then achieve standing with assistance, followed by walking with assistance, which then leads to standing alone, and lastly, walking alone. The one milestone that did not always follow the general order was hands and knees crawling. Sometimes children would crawl on their hands and knees before being able to stand with assistance. 4.3% of infants did not exhibit hands and knees crawling at all. They skipped this milestone and went straight into walking. The windows of achievement overlap. The start of each window of achievement for every milestone does not begin near the end of the previous milestone window, but rather begins near the beginning of the previous milestone window. This overlap acknowledges the wide age variability of infants and toddlers achieving these milestones. The length of each milestone window varies across the motor skills. Walking alone and standing alone have the longest achievement window, suggesting that these two abilities have the most variability in age of achievement. For example, some children began walking alone around eight months of age, while others did not achieve this milestone until after 17 months of age. On the other hand, sitting without support and standing with assistance showed the two most narrow windows of achievement, suggesting that these two abilities have the least variability in age of achievement. Motor milestone chart limitations. Gross motor milestone charts, while important, do not capture the complex developments 
that lead up to achieving specific milestones. Take, for example, the process to be able to sit independently. The ability to maintain balance in the seating posture gradually emerges between two and nine months of age. When infants are five to six months old, they are able to prop sit or sit independently for short periods. At six months, hip joint mobility increases, allowing the thighs to rest on the contact surface and the infant is able to sit with their legs in a ring position, that is, symmetrically flexed, abducted with externally rotated hips and flexed knees. Between eight to nine months, the trunk and pelvis muscles stabilize the sitting position, allowing the infant to narrow the support base for balanced independent sitting. After being able to sit independently, infants learn to perform a coordinated action between upper limbs, trunk, and lower limbs as they are able to use their lower body to balance as they reach with their upper limbs. Thus, unlike milestone charts that simply show sitting to occur, sitting without support is a process that takes place over many months and involves a complex interplay between various muscles that prepare for the eventual achievement of sitting. Another limitation of motor milestones is that they convey the idea that once an infant performs a motor milestone, like walking, that the infant has fully achieved this milestone. The reality is that motor development involves numerous bouts of successes and failures with each milestone ability. An infant that successfully walks once may fall the very next attempt. Karen Adolph and her colleagues have documented the number of steps and falls toddlers have as they learn to walk. Toddlers between 12 to 18 months of age take an average of 2,368 steps in just one hour and cover a distance of 701 meters, the length of almost eight football fields. This is just one hour. Multiplying these numbers by the total number of hours toddlers are awake is even more eye-opening. In six hours, a toddler could accumulate around 14,000 total steps and cover the distance of 46 football fields. Despite these infants clearly being able to walk, they also continue to fall. In fact, the average toddler fell 17 times each hour. One toddler even fell 69 times in one hour. Every day, infants are practicing various motor skills and body positions. For example, the figure on the screen provides insight into the various motor behaviors and body positions from one 10-month-old infant. While the majority of time was spent in a seated position, 40.5%, the infant was consistently practicing various other positions, frequently rotating between them. Gross Motor Development in the process of gross motor development, the first mobility that infants usually require is crawling. There are different types of infant crawling, such as belly crawling and hands and knees crawling. Belly crawling is the action in which infants move by pulling the body across the ground on the abdomen. Hands and knees crawling means moving by lifting the abdomen up on both arms and knees. Some infants experience both belly crawling and hands and knees crawling. Others experience only hands and knees crawling. Previous studies have explored a relationship between belly crawling and hands and knees crawling. Infants who formerly belly crawled showed more proficient hands and knees crawling than those who skipped the belly crawling period. Infants who spend a greater amount of time awake in the prone position, abdomen on ground, such as during tummy time, achieve hands and knees crawling at an earlier age. Tummy time. Tummy time describes the times when a caregiver places an infant on their stomach while the infant is awake and someone is watching. Tummy time is not only an important way to prevent flat spots on the baby's head, it's also an important part of the baby's normal growth. In fact, Tummy time is positively related to overall gross motor development. Tummy time is especially important for infants who are at risk of motor delays and or who have a motor-related disability. While tummy time is supported by many professionals and well-respected organizations, there are arguments against the necessity of the practice. Tummy time is important for many reasons. Tummy time helps prevent 
flat spots on the back of an infant's head, makes neck and shoulder muscles stronger so infants can start to sit up, crawl, and walk, improves infant motor skills. Infants benefit from two to three tummy time sessions each day for a short period of time, three to five minutes. As they grow and show enjoyment of tummy time, the length of the sessions can be increased. As infants grow older, more tummy time helps build strength for sitting up, rolling over, crawling, and walking. Tummy time tips. These suggestions can help make tummy time more enjoyable. Spread out a blanket in a clear area of the floor for tummy time. Try short tummy time sessions after a diaper change or after an infant wakes from a nap. Put a toy or toys within an infant's reach during tummy time to help them learn to play and interact with their surroundings. Have an adult be in the infant's field of view during tummy time to encourage interaction and bonding. As an infant gets older, tummy time sessions can last longer and can take place more often throughout the day. Gross motor development, postural affordances. Postures, the particular body and limb configurations used at any moment, mediate motor development in meaningful ways. For example, the acquisition of each new posture provides a unique lens through which infants can view the world as they accrue a range of motor possibilities for moving about and physically interacting with the environment. Depending on the motor skill level and posture used, Physical interactions with objects can be facilitated or reduced. For example, when seated, infants' hands are free, allowing them to manually manipulate and explore objects in sophisticated ways. When in a prone position, lying abdomen down, however, infants are limited to using one hand to lift their torso up off the ground while using the other to reach out for an object, which greatly reduces the range of actions. In older infants, Crawling and walking positions have different affordances. During crawling, infants are less likely than walking infants to carry objects. In comparison, when walking, infants' hands are free to interact with objects in complex ways, and the change of position opens up a new field of view for further exploration. Thus, each posture provides unique affordances on how the body can be used. Consider the figure on the screen, which shows an image of an infant holding an object with one hand while using the other hand for balance. In which ways does the infant's current crawling posture afford and restrict how the infant can explore the object? If the infant transitioned into a standing or walking position, how would the affordances and restrictions change? Postures can also alter the stability of the body the demand of attentional resources, and what can be perceived in the surroundings. Certain postures and their relative stability can even influence the use of the limbs and hands. For example, transitioning from sitting to crawling and from crawling to walking affects the way infants use their arms for reaching and retrieving objects. Unstable postures often require more of the infant's effort for balance, such as when the hands are needed to hold onto surfaces during cruising, or when the hands may be needed to balance the body when standing is a new motor skill still being learned. When the hands are used for balance, they are less likely to be used for holding and exploring objects. Thus, research has shown that postural progression and postural control can influence infants' experiences with objects, people, and their wider environments. Infants' expanding repertoire of postural skills as they acquire motor skills affects their manipulatory behaviors and interactive activities with objects in their surroundings. Gross motor development, environmental affordances. Think about the physical environment where you live. How does the furniture influence where and how people stand and sit? Where eating takes place? The posture and arrangement people are in when socializing? How objects like televisions, windows, or fireplaces influence the structure and positioning of furniture, which results in how and where people sit and orient in the room, etc. Just as the physical environment is important for considering how adults sit, stand, and move about in space, the physical environment for infants and toddlers affords various physical movement possibilities. The theory of affordance represents an important theoretical framework for considering the environment's role in supporting and encouraging motor development in infants and toddlers. In this theory, 
The physical environment is believed to afford or allow the child possibilities and actions. The characteristics and features of the indoor environment can therefore be hypothesized to influence children's gross motor development. The affordances of the physical environment are what the environment offers the child. For example, a toddler's classroom's affordances are the physical size of the classroom, the toys and materials available, the number of peers for potential play partners, and adults who set up the play environment, ensure its overall safety, manage the day-to-day -day operations, and interact with the children. Let's look again at the gross motor windows of achievement chart for the six gross motor milestones again. The six milestones in the chart are sitting without support, standing with assistance, hands and knees crawling, walking with assistance, standing alone, and walking alone. For each milestone, how could the physical environment support and encourage the infant or toddler as they progress towards achieving a specific milestone? For example, Consider the milestone of standing with assistance. What role could the environment have? As the child is not yet able to stand independently, they are taking advantage of structures in the environment that afford assistance in getting into a standing position and remaining upright. Therefore, structures that allow a child to hold on to and pull up are important, as are structures that can be used for support to remain standing. When an environment includes structures at a low height, it supports a child's progress toward achieving this milestone. If an environment only has high structures built for adults, the motor and movement possibilities for a child are more limited. Caregivers should consider how both the indoor and outdoor environments afford infants and toddlers the opportunity to practice and challenge their current motor skills safely. As caregivers observe and reflect upon the motor development progress of infants and toddlers, they should consider how to modify the environment to continue to support and encourage motor development. For example, for infants practicing standing with support, caregivers should ensure there are structures that can be used to help infants pull themselves up and offer continual support at an appropriate height. Outside, is the play equipment age appropriate and supportive of gross motor development? The pictures on the screen show two angles of the same play structure geared for toddlers. Considering the construction of it, what elements are there that can support the developmental progression of toddlers' gross motor skills? While parts of the structure may be challenging for some toddlers, what elements are built in to support toddlers as their gross motor skills improve? Fine motor development. Fine motor skills involve more exact movements of the feet, toes, hands, and fingers. While fine motor skills are slower to develop in accordance with the proximal distal trend, remarkable progress is made in fine motor development during the first two years. In just the first few years of life, children go from having no intentional fine motor control to being able to manipulate objects to play and learn as well as beginning to take care of themselves. Just as with gross motor milestones, there are complex developments that lead up to achieving specific fine motor milestones. Take for example, the fine motor milestone of grasping an object. Reaching to grasp an object, which could be perceived as a relatively simple action, requires a complex compilation of smaller abilities working synchronously together. Successful reaching to a stimulus, whether it is located on the body or in external space, typically involves the coordination of at least two different action systems, reaching and grasping. Effective reaching requires individuals not only to extend their hands to the location of an object, but also to open and orient the hand to prepare to grasp the specific object. Developmentally, research indicates that the reaching system develops before grasping, reflecting a proximal distal sequence in the development of grasping. For example, before four months, infants develop the ability to extend their hand to the location of an object, but during this period, the hand is often fisted when it contacts the object. By four months, however, 
infants begin to open the hand in advance of contacting the object. Likewise, with regard to self-touch, closed hand contacts prevail in the first two or three months, and open hand contacts begin to increase in frequency between three and five months. Even after infants achieve the ability to reach for and grasp an object, there is still further development in this milestone that occurs. There is an improvement in reaching kinematics as six-month-old infants develop a straight arm trajectory accompanied by fewer movements. During this phase of reaching development, there are many factors that influence arm trajectory. However, the development of postural control for maintaining stability during reaching is one of the most significant. Since reaching requires, quote, whole body engagement, end quote, its achievement is highly dependent on posture. At about three months, when arm extensions are being replaced by goal-directed reaches, but upright sitting is not yet mastered, infant reaching is better with external support. As infants generate the ability to sit independently, reaching becomes more coordinated and they can use their body to balance as they reach outward. Development of grasping. The development of grasping is an important part of fine motor development. As infants and toddlers develop, they progress through different types of grasping. Children are born with a palmar reflex grasp. It is an involuntary reflexive response present in newborns, but begins to appear around 16 weeks gestation. To elicit the reflex, a caregiver can use their finger to stroke the palm of the infant. The palmar grasp reflex comprises two phases, finger closure and clinging. The infant's fingers undergo flexion to enclose the examiner's finger and the pressure applied to the palm produces traction on the finger's tendons, leading to the clinging action. The thumb is not involved in this reflex. The palmar grasp reflex disappears typically by six months of age, signifying healthy brain maturation and is replaced by the development of voluntary grasping. The palmar reflex probably serves to create a basic motor pattern that lays the foundation for obtaining later grasping ability. Additionally, it creates interaction and bonding between the infant and the caregiver. The palmar reflex grasp is replaced by the ulnar grasp, which is a clumsy motion in which an infant's fingers close against the palm. The ulnar grasp typically develops around three to four months of age and increases infant's ability to explore objects. As infants learn to sit independently, both hands are freed up to explore objects. Therefore, around four to five months of age, infants are able to transfer objects between their hands. The pincer grasp is when the pointer finger and the thumb squeeze together to grasp an object. Infants are usually able to perform a pincer grasp by the age of nine to 10 months. With each change in grasping ability, infants are able to interact with different objects and in new ways. For example, the owner grasp only allows for larger objects to be held onto, while the pincer grasp permits an infant to pick up smaller objects. To support infants, caregivers should carefully observe infants' grasping progression and provide materials that can easily be manipulated based on their current grasping techniques. Active object exploration emerges around three to six months of age with the onset of reaching and grasping. At six months of age, infants spend the majority of their time mouthing and grasping objects, and this sharply declines with concurrent improvements in complex manual exploratory behavior such as fingering, transferring, and rotating objects. As a result, caregivers should provide young infants with materials that they can easily grasp onto and that are safe for mouthing. Once infants begin to sit and develop more complex grasping techniques, such as the owner grasp, caregivers should provide materials that are more complex in design characteristics, but still light, easy to hold onto in one hand, easy to transfer between hands, and safe for mouthing. Infant exploratory behaviors are influenced by object properties, including size, shape, texture, and weight of objects. Infants change their grasping patterns depending on object size. Smaller objects are grasped unimanually, and larger objects are grasped bimanually. Research has demonstrated 
variation in infant's grasping patterns based on object structure, such as two-handed grasp for larger objects and pincer grips for smaller and softer objects. Additionally, 12 to 14 month old infants showed appropriate anticipatory changes in grasp formation based on object shape and size. 9 to 12 month old infants explored object properties such as shape, size, and texture by rotating, fingering, and transferring objects, whereas they explored properties such as weight, sound, and rigidity by banging and shaking objects. This research suggests that with older infants, caregivers should provide materials that are more complex in design and diverse in characteristics such as size, shape, texture, and weight. As older infants use their developing grasping abilities to explore materials, caregivers can continue to observe how they interact with the materials and provide materials based on what characteristics infants seem most interested in exploring. The figure on the screen shows various manipulative objects, cardboard tube, wood clothespin, metal jar lid, plastic bottle lid, cork, plastic hair curlers, wood ring. As you look over the objects, consider which objects would best support the different grasping abilities of infants. For infants using an ulnar grasp, which objects would be best to share with them? For infants using a pincer grasp, which object would be best to share with them? How might the physical properties of each object change how the infants explore them? Individual Differences – The Role of Cultural Child Care Practices Despite a common sequence of motor skill acquisition, there are individual differences in age for the acquisition of motor skills, highlighting the importance of the physical environment and caregiver practices. Ever since milestone charts attempted to document what quote-unquote normal ages to achieve motor milestones are, variation in type and timing of motor development have been reported. For example, motor development in non-Western countries was found to defer from Western norms, and these differences were related to differences in caregiving practices. Even within the Western world, there is cultural variability in the timing of motor milestone attainment. Differences in cultural beliefs and caregiving practices lead to differences in when children achieve motor milestones. For example, there are differences between Dutch and Israeli caregivers in their beliefs about motor development, such that Israeli caregivers attribute more importance to encouraging motor development in the quote-unquote right order and obtaining expert advice. Dutch caregivers, on the other hand, attribute greater importance to letting children follow their own pace in motor development. Studies show that motor development of Dutch children is delayed compared to children in other Western countries, including Israel. The body of cross-cultural research further supports the perspective that motor development is not a universal process. The social and physical environment has a significant role. For example, practicing standing and sitting and applying massage or stretching of the limbs is common in African and Caribbean cultures, but less common in Western cultures. In Tajikistan and other parts of Central Asia, a traditional caregiving practice involves Gavora cradling. Children from birth to 20 months of age are bound on their backs in a tightly wrapped swaddle with arms extended along the sides of the torso and legs straightened and tied together for more than 20 hours per day for some children. Infants are not unwrapped for feeding because mothers lean over the cradle to breastfeed, and they are not removed for toileting because infants urinate through an external catheter and defecate through a hole in the bottom of the cradle. According to the prevailing view among pediatricians and psychologists, severe movement restriction in infancy could have deleterious effects, especially across the first two years of life a critical period in children's health and development. For example, the extended and abducted position of the legs, especially in the first few months, could lead to hip dysplasia or pigeon-toed gait. Extended time in the supine position could lead to brachycephaly, flattening of the back of the head. Restricted movement, especially in older infants, could delay development of postural and motor skills.
As the figure on the screen shows, the younger infant spent more hours in a gavor than older toddlers. However, 20% of older infants, 12 to 24 month olds, continue to be cradled for more than 15 hours per day. It's important to note that in Tajik families, children are prized and the center of family life. Tajik caregivers responded immediately to vocalizations from their cradled infants by feeding them, rocking them, or singing to them. Mothers, grandmothers, aunts, neighbors, and older siblings were readily available, interchangeable, and responsive. And Tajik children of all ages, including siblings and village children, surrounded the Gavora and interacted with the infants. One value of a cultural approach is the discovery of new phenomena that challenge widespread assumptions about caregiving practices and the quote-unquote natural course of child development. Cultural beliefs, customs, and practices, geography, climate, and village resources compel caregivers to find ways to keep their children healthy and safe. Gavora cradling is a widespread cultural practice throughout Tajikistan and presumably other parts of Central Asia. Yet the practice flies in the face of Western norms, theories, and even who standards. As caregivers of infants and toddlers, it is essential to be aware of and respect cultural differences in caregiving practices. Motor Development – Relation with Other Areas of Development While motor development is often presented as an individual chapter separate from other developmental domains such as language, social-emotional, cognition, the reality is that children's motor abilities are developing alongside these other domains and growth in one domain often influences the other domains. Motor skills are at the core of infants and toddlers' everyday actions and interactions and consequently affect subsequent perceptual, cognitive, and language development. Piaget suggested a relation between motor and cognitive development and noted that infants' own actions and resulting sensory motor experiences are critical for their learning about the environment and the objects within it. Since Piaget's original observations, several studies have reported evidence for relations between motor skills and development in seemingly unrelated domains. Growing evidence suggests that acquiring more advanced control over body position affords infants opportunities for learning and exploration. For example, infants' visual experiences differ according to body position, while prone Infants' field of view is dominated by the ground surface and objects near the body, whereas upright infants have a more expansive view of their surroundings that includes distant objects and faces. Sitting facilitates visual and manual exploration of objects compared with laying prone or supine. Walking compared to crawling allows infants to travel farther more easily carry objects, and elicits different social responses from caregivers. Accordingly, learning to sit and walk is linked with downstream improvements in language learning and spatial cognition. Presumably, these facilitative effects result from infants spending more time sitting, standing, and walking. For example, mastering the ability to sit independently nearly doubled the amount of time that six-month-olds spent sitting in daily life, both independent and supported sitting, compared with six-month-olds not yet sitting, and infants who spend more time sitting have increased opportunities to explore objects with both hands. Developmental Cascades Theory The Developmental Cascades Hypothesis emphasizes the consequences following achievement of new motor skills as a driving force during development. Developmental cascades refer to the cumulative consequences of advances in one domain, such as motor skills, on later behaviors or abilities. Gaining a new skill leads to significant and long-lasting changes in the child's everyday experiences by altering what kind of information is accessible and how others respond to the child. According to the developmental cascades theory, the onset of a new motor skill may provide infants with access to new learning opportunities associated with that motor skill. For example, being able to sit without support frees the hands for manual exploration of objects and enables learning about object features such as weight, texture, and function. Sitting also frees the hands for the production of communicative gestures, which have been found to support language development. Further, 
Setting changes the infant's point of view, providing novel perceptual experiences and encouraging face-to-face -face exchanges with their caregivers. And finally, parents react to changes in infants' abilities and adjust how they respond to the child. Relationship between motor skills and language development. While motor and language development may seem like two very different developmental areas, research has shown within the first three years of life that these two areas are strongly related. Infants and toddlers who achieve motor milestones earlier show greater language abilities. For example, in a large group of children between 10 to 14 months of age, some will be walking while others will not yet be able to walk. Children who begin to walk earlier have larger receptive and productive vocabularies than those who are not yet able to walk. The onset of independent sitting and walking have both been found to predict later productive vocabulary sizes between 16 and 28 months. This relationship between motor development and language development actually begins even earlier. Infants between three to five months of age who can independently sit earlier than others show greater language abilities as toddlers. A large study of 62,944 children found that motor skills at 18 months were predictive of subsequent language skills at 36 months of age. In addition to gross motor skills, fine motor skills between 12 and 18 months of age have been found to predict expressive language at 36 months in infants at a high genetic risk for autism spectrum disorder. Why is there a relationship between motor abilities and later language abilities? It is unlikely that the acquisition of walking per se causes infants to develop language, just as it is unlikely that infant language causes the onset of walking. Rather, the onset of walking increases the infant's visual field and permits greater flexibility with which to view the environment. These physical changes may promote infant following of adult attentional cues and thereby facilitate language learning. Engaging in joint attention behavior is essential for the development of language. Such episodes of joint engagement occur when one individual directs the attention of another to a shared referent, such as an object or event. Multiple studies have found that infant following of adult attentional cues is related to language development. Likewise, infant initiation of joint engagement, such as pointing, is associated with later language development. Perhaps not surprisingly, infant joint attention, particularly following adult gaze, also develops markedly following the infant's first birthday, when infants typically begin to walk. Furthermore, infant walking also has a significant impact on how the infant engages with the caregiver. Walking infants have been observed to be more likely to access objects located further away than crawling infants. Additionally, engaging in mobile bids for the caregiver's attention, such as carrying an object to the caregiver, elicits more interactive and verbally rich responses by the caregiver, and such bids are more frequent by walking than crawling infants. Walking infants have also been found to direct the caregiver's attention to objects using vocalizations and gestures more than crawling infants. These findings indicate that not only may the walking infant be more attuned to follow adult attentional cues, but they also help to generate social context in which they themselves elicit caregiver attention. The onset of walking affords infants new ways to communicate, freeing the hands for gesture and by being able to carry and move objects, and share their interests, which results in richer language from caregivers. Relationship between motor skills and developmental delays and disabilities. As motor development can be tracked early on in infancy and toddlerhood, Motor skills can be used as a potential early marker for later outcomes in children at risk of a delay or disability. Research has found that delays in motor development are linked to diagnoses such as autism spectrum disorder, ASD, and developmental language disorders. Infants at high familial risk for ASD, infants who have an older sibling with an ASD diagnosis, and who receive an ASD diagnosis later in childhood, showed reduced fine motor and grasping skills and delayed development of posture skills, such as sitting and standing, during the first three years. More children with a developmental language disorder are late in reaching gross and particularly fine motor milestones than children without a developmental language disorder. Motor delays are also commonly reported in children with Down syndrome, 
Williams syndrome, and in children born preterm. Conclusion Motor development is an amazing domain to learn about because growth in motor abilities can be easily observed by caregivers and provides unique insight into children's developing understanding of the world. As motor abilities progress, caregivers have an important role in supporting children by providing materials and creative physical environments that both support and challenge developing skills.